So um, our laboratory um, is interested in particular in how are these connections actually formed. Um, and this is uh, an image here of a neuron from the hippocampus, a region that you've been um, already hearing a lot about, so I don't need to explain it. And if we zoom in, um, we can see uh, these things that look like spines are actually called dendritic spines, and these are the receiving end of connections um, between neurons. And so um, one of the reasons that scientists are so interested um, in brain cell connections is because long-term changes um, in the network of neuronal connections allow the brain to um, store information. So we build new connections not just during development or during repair, but also as a normal part of the brain's cognitive function. So if we step back for a minute and take a look at a, um, a, a root map that um, probably everyone in this room is familiar with. Um, if we look at an, an airline route map, much like air travel, um, a, most of the um, action, or at least a majority of the action um, in the brain actually occurs at the terminals themselves, uh, not en route. So terminals, um, in fact, is, is also, um, the name terminal is, is also applied to synaptic terminals, so uh, connections between brain cells are also actually called terminals themselves. And uh, like the terminal shown here, brain cell connections are very intricate places. And so um, you can appreciate here the many components that are required to make a terminal, and the same thing is true of a brain cell connection. So really, um, one of the questions that our laboratory focuses on is how do neurons orchestrate expression um, of all the correct genes or components to control the growth of these synaptic connections? And uh, as we learn more about this, we're also interested in looking at how this process might be dysregulated in different brain disorders. So I use the word um, expression of genes here. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to step back for a minute and talk about what, what do I mean when I say that we're expressing a gene. So gene, a gene starts at the level of DNA, which is subsequently made into RNA and made into protein. So this is probably taking you back to high school biology. Um, and in, scientists have known for quite a while that gene expression, changes in gene expression, is required for mediating lasting changes in the function of brain cell connections. And not only in the function, but also um, in the number and even in the shape of brain cell connections. Until more recently, uh, gene expression was studied a great deal at the level of uh, what's called transcription, which means the flow of information between the DNA to the RNA. But um, more, more recently, it's, it has been appreciated that the complement of proteins in cells, which are really the workhorses that carry out the function of cells, this complement of proteins is often not, uh, not so well reflected by the complement of RNAs in the cell. So what, what that has really um, revealed through many high throughput studies is that there's a great deal of regulation occurring between the RNA and the protein. And this is called um, post-transcriptional regulation. And in our laboratory has been um, particularly interested in this type of regulation. And, um, and that is because we are really interested in understanding how do you get all of the necessary proteins, components assembled in order to build stronger synapses or to form new synapses. So we want to look at, at this level. So as a model system, our laboratory has been using a, um, a growth factor that stimulates the production of synapses, and this is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Neurotrophic just means growth for neurons, so it's brain, BDNF is the, is the short um, abbreviation for that. Uh, BDNF is released by activity at uh, neuronal connections, and it can cause neurons to grow and build stronger connections and also to grow new connections. And it also, um, of particular interest to us, it upregulates the production um, using post-transcriptional mechanisms of only the specific select proteins which are required to um, build new synapses. So BDNF is of particular interest as a model system for us to understand how you specify making only the correct components that you need and not incorrect components, and how you specify producing 
um, each component that you need in all the right um, amounts because it's very, very selective. So BDNF, out of all of these um, RNA molecules that I'm showing here, really upregulates the production um, to protein of, from only about 4% of these RNA molecules. So the question we want to ask is, how are the correct proteins made to build stronger um, connections between neurons? So um, I'm going to skip how we discovered it, and I'm just going to go to um, what we discovered. Uh, so what we found is that there are uh, small RNA molecules, uh, which, which were previously discovered, to turn genes on and off. And these small RNA molecules are called microRNA, so small RNA. And what they can do is they act at the level of the RNA by um, physically um, um, binding to the RNA in a, um, in a partially complementary manner, and this acts to uh, turn off the production of protein from that RNA. So what our laboratory discovered is that BDNF itself regulates the production of these microRNAs. And so what, is, what does that mean? So um, microRNAs are produced by the cell from precursors. So these uh, structures that you see at the top of the slide that look like uh, clothespins, those are um, actually microRNA precursors, so they're a form of, of RNA. Um, and in the cell, in a, in, a, in a relatively rapid manner, these precursors can be made into this mature functional RNA, uh, microRNA. And the microRNA, shown as these little short 17, they're, they're 17 to 22 or so nucleotides each. They can then bind to their um, target RNA, and as I showed you previously, they will, they will shut down that target RNA. Now these microRNAs can be, um, can be very selective because they match in a, in a semi-complementary way to the RNA, so they, they won't bind all RNAs, they'll only bind an RNA um, to which um, they have some um, complementarity. Um, but they also can regulate mini RNAs. So they are also a mechanism that the cell can use to orchestrate the controlled production of proteins from mini, a, a suite of RNAs, for example. So what does BDNF do? So what we found is that one of the ways in which BDNF controls uh, the microRNA production um, is by imparting some selectivity to the process. Um, so how does it, it do this? Uh, so one thing that we found is that BDNF, um, shown here um, on, the, on your right, um, actually increases the levels of a protein um, called LIN28, which binds to only certain precursors. So LIN28 levels, the levels of this protein go up in response to BDNF, and it binds only to precursors which have, have this particular motif um, in, this, in their loop. And so that loop, um, serves as a, a binding region for this protein, and, and this protein ends up then destroying selectively those particular precursors. So um, here's some data showing that we see that BDNF rapidly enhances the levels of LIN28 protein, and this subsequently leads to a rapid um, downregulation in, in this particular class of microRNAs called the LET7 family of microRNAs. So what this does actually then is causes certain precursors to disappear and relieves from repression mRNA, which were previously um, being, being um, quieted by those microRNAs, are now free and can be made into proteins. So this is a way that you can impart selectivity for pro-growth proteins. So BDNF comes along, selectively removes certain precursor microRNAs, which leads to a loss in repression, a loss in the silencing of those um, genes which would otherwise be repressed. So I've introduced uh, a protein to you, um, LIN28, and I want to step back and tell you a little bit about LIN28 and why it was a surprise for us um, in the first place to find that it was being expressed in the brain. So um, LIN28 and its ability to control the LET7 microRNAs is actually a highly evolutionarily um, conserved uh, process. And it was first um, discovered, actually, to regulate developmental timing um, in worms. And it is conserved all the way up to humans. So in this particular pathway, 
typically LIN28 um, protein levels are very high in stem cells, in progenitor cells. Um, and in fact, and, and because of that, the LET7 microRNAs are very low in stem cells. And as cells differentiate, um, their LIN28 levels go down and their levels of LET7 microRNAs go up. So you have more um, suppression of these growth promoting um, genes um, in differentiated cells. And in fact, LIN28 was not previously believed to even be um, expressed in, in differentiated cells. And so what we found was, was really, was very interesting is that the, the brain, neurons in the brain are able to re-harness um, this pathway for producing um, growth of, of, from suites of genes by um, transiently upregulating their levels of LIN28 protein. So in, interesting, LIN28 um, is also um, one of this cocktail of uh, factors, which if you have ever heard of LIN28, this might be where you heard of it. So it's one of these cocktail of factors that you can um, use to program a differentiated cell to turn back um, into a pluripotent cell. Um, it's only one in, in, um, in a set of these which are required, but its expression is one of the strongest predictors of whether you will successfully produce a pluripotent cell. In humans, the LIN28 LET7 axis is now um, known to control growth in multiple settings. And you can see by some of the citations I've listed here that there's been, um, that, that most of this discovery is very recent. And there's really been an explosion in our understanding of how this particular axis of gene control is really conserved from worms to humans and is regulating lots of growth processes in humans. So now we can add to that list that it's also um, regulating um, genes that are involved in, in growing uh, brain cell connections. So during neural growth and plasticity, the neuron um, transiently upregulates LIN28 protein and sort of moves back along this axis to um, lower its LET7 microRNAs and express more genes that control growth. And this may actually work very well in the brain um, in part because um, prior to receiving a growth stimulus such as, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the levels of LET7 microRNAs are very high. So what this means is that many of these growth-promoting genes are very efficiently being, um, being repressed um, at under basal conditions and, and that when you lower the amount of these LET7 microRNAs, you can actually have a substantial effect um, in turning these genes on. Um, so I want to just talk for a minute about, um, about our, our laboratory's interest in, um, in seeing whether we might take something that's such a, a basic discovery and see whether it might be involved in disease. So you've heard already this morning about a number of diseases in which the growth of um, neurons and neuronal connections is important. So um, our laboratory is currently looking um, at several models where um, we believe the LIN28 LET7 um, axis of growth control um, is likely to be dysregulated. Um, and one reason um, uh, that actually looking at this axis is particularly exciting is because um, there, there is a high potential for therapeutic um, intervention. So uh, LET7 microRNAs in, in other systems um, are already um, being targeted for, um, for in clinical trials. So the thing I listed here, this word antagomere, what that means is, is that is um, a synthetic um, molecule which is made that antagonizes a microRNA. So you can make antagomeres, you can also make microRNA mimics, and you can synthesize relatively um, stable products which can be um, delivered, um, in our case, to, to rodents. Um, but um, in areas outside the brain are already actually in clinical trials. So there's a number of ways to manipulate the, um, this access, and, and one of them is also um, something that we have done, which is by mutating the recognition site um, on, the, on the precursor um, so that LIN28, um, this molecule, can no longer recognize and decrease um, that. So the, the other details in this processing aren't important, but what you can see is that um, on, on the side here, that because we've mutated this, even though LIN28 goes up, you can no longer actually destroy that precursor. So I want to give, um, as an example um, of, of a disease we, we would be interested in, um, autism spectrum disorders. So um, these are diagnosed in about 1% of the population. It's very common. As you heard 
earlier, there are many, many genes which have been linked um, to autism spectrum disorders. And so um, one of the challenges uh, going forward for neuroscientists is really to understand um, what are the commonalities between all of these genes that have been linked to autism. And, um, and, and this includes um, also genes which are mutated um, probably in idiopathic autism. Um, and so one thing that's, that's interesting to us uh, is that looking at an axis such as the LIN28 LET7 axis allows us to look at a pathway which might actually be controlling many different genes. So um, in some ways that's very exciting when we're looking for commonalities to explain how so many different genes could actually lead to autism. So in autism spectrum disorders, you um, in fact have um, disruption in gene expression at the level of protein synthesis, and you also have overgrowth of these neuronal connections. So if you look at the, um, these are example of these spines which I showed you in the very first slide, and you can see in, the, in both the um, patients and in mouse models with Fragile X, you have an overgrowth of um, these spines, and, and you actually have an overproduction of synaptic connections. So this is um, kind of a um, somewhat unusual a model of a cognitive disorder in that as opposed to having too few connections, you actually um, develop too many um, connections. And so one of the questions um, that we would like to ask is um, whether this um, could occur as a result of altered developmental regulation of um, this axis. So I want to um, end now by just um, thanking the people um, in my lab and um, also our funding sources, which includes also the Simons Foundation for um, Autism Research.